I did a show last night, and I talked about some things that are going on in the United States and how they relate to other things that are going on in foreign countries. And in particular, I made comments uh, on the show last night about uh, very serious discoveries that were made by United States Special Operations Forces engaged in the raid which resulted in the death of the founder of ISIS, Abu Baker al-Baghdadi. And uh, apparently, quite a number of you were taken back by some of the things I said. And, you, you know, you went out and you researched a little bit. And I had numerous requests to cover the topic again tonight because people who may not have been able to hear this startling, stunning, terrifying information, um, you know, via WBCQ, will now certainly be able to hear it thanks to the fact that, you know, we're also on WRMI. And that has to do with the way uh, the antennas are aimed by these high-powered shortwave radio stations. WBCQ is up in northern Maine, right on the border of Canada. And their antenna is aimed toward Mexico City. So it's 50,000 watts coming out of Maine, headed toward Mexico City. So if you can follow that like on a, you know, on a 45 degree angle, that gets very much of the center and southwestern United States while the signal is on its way to Mexico. Gets all of Mexico. And then it goes out into the Pacific Ocean and it gets out by uh, Tonga and sometimes Australia and New Zealand. But WRMI is located down by Lake Okeechobee in Florida. And they have a 100,000 watt transmitter and the antenna is aimed north toward toronto ontario canada because wrmi is twice as powerful and because the uh, radiation angle of their antenna is a little wider everybody in all 48 contiguous united states can hear wrmi on 9455 in fact everyone in canada Every square inch of Canada can hear WRMI. And the folks in eastern Alaska can hear WRMI. I've gotten emails from military troops and scientists up at the North Pole tune into this show, right, from listening on WRMI. So that's kind of cool. And then, of course, folks in uh, Utah listening on KYAH, that's regular AM radio. They can be trucking around in their cars or their pickup trucks or sitting at home and they can, you know, listen to it on regular radio. So there's a lot of coverage. But thanks to this being Wednesday night and WRMI uh, carrying the Wednesday night show, a lot more people be able to hear this material tonight. And it is, it is stunning. It is stunning. So let me get right down to it uh, because I I don't want to spend too much of the show tonight doing what I did on the show last night. You all know, because President Trump announced it over the weekend, the U.S. Special Operations Forces raided a place inside Syria. And during the course of that raid, the founder of ISIS, a guy named Abu Baker al-Baghdadi, Abu Baker al-Baghdadi, I have trouble with these names, uh, <laughs> uh, was uh, killed. He was the founder and leader of ISIS, the Islamic States of Iraq and Syria, ISIS. When our special operations forces finished their raid, they searched and they seized. They seized computers. They seized communications devices. They seized secure communications devices and they seized lots and lots and lots of paperwork and files they brought all this stuff back and it was turned over to defense intelligence which started going through it and news broke yesterday that among the paperwork seized in the raid at uh, al-baghdadi's compound were diplomatic cables 
between al-Baghdadi and the U.S. State Department. And, you know, I pointed out last night that when I use the term cables, that doesn't mean like your internet ethernet cable, right? A cable is a term of art for a, uh, a, a piece of paper, a document, a secure method that uh, governments and embassies use to communicate back and forth. That's called a cable. And uh, they found these cables between Baghdadi and the U.S. State Department. This was an astonishing thing to find. I found out in uh, follow-ups that the diplomatic cables were not the only thing that was found. I can now freshly report to all of you that secure communications equipment with the digital encryption keys for transmitting to and from the United States Department of State were also seized. The guy had voice communication with the State Department. And now, some of you, you know, your jaws are hanging open now because this is obviously spectacular and stunning and horrifying uh, information. What was the leader of the most vicious, murderous, destructive terrorist group on planet Earth, ISIS, doing with diplomatic cables going back and forth to U.S. State Department and with high-technology encrypted communications gear that had the encryption keys to communicate by voice to the State Department. Now, I have not been told what was in the diplomatic cables. But the fact that there was ongoing communication in writing between Baghdadi slash ISIS and the U.S. Department of State is horrifying to me because as as a layman, as a regular average citizen, I say to myself, the government was in on it. And I don't say that lightly. For years, we have heard that ISIS was a creation of the U.S., the U.K., Israel, and other sovereign governments. Some people even claimed but there was never any substantiation that ISIS actually stood for Israeli Secret Intelligence Service. Over the course of the years of the goings-on in the Middle East, we have seen uh, images of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu visiting hospital beds of ISIS fighters being treated for their wounds in Israeli hospitals. Why would the Prime Minister of Israel visit the hospital room of an ISIS fighter? And then, you know, we also have um, uh, the fact that when ISIS camps were uh, destroyed, conquered, uh, you know, through firefights and stuff, inside those camps were, you know, food from like, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, bandages and medical gear from places like Bahrain or Qatar, uh, and then weapons, much of it U.S. made. So there's a lot of ancillary stuff that was going on, which led many people to think the government is involved. Now there's proof. Diplomatic cables in the compound of ISIS leader and now secure communications equipment between his compound and the U.S. State Department ISIS came into existence solely during the administration of U.S. President Barack Obama how is it that this terror group had this American communications technology, and with whom uh, were they communicating 
in the U.S. State Department. It is a federal felony in the United States of America to provide material support to terrorists. That's a federal crime. It is also a federal crime to conspire with others to commit acts of terrorism. It is also a federal crime if through the conspiracy people get murdered. Is there any doubt that ISIS murdered people? Well, if people in our government, in the United States government, are communicating with this guy who leads ISIS, if they're supplying him with material hardware that ISIS can, you know, use, then it seems to me as an average American citizen, and, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I, I am not competent to make a legal opinion, seems to me that, that that's all federal felonies. And I want the people who did that to be arrested. If I did that, sure as hell I'd be arrested. It doesn't magically become lawful when government does it. We have equal protection of the law pursuant to the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. That means the law applies to everybody in America. Everybody. From the lowest of the low to the highest and mightiest. So, I mean, this is stunning stuff. Now, tracking Abu Baker al-Baghdadi was very difficult. You heard President Trump when he described the raid that killed him, killed uh, Baghdadi. You heard the President say the guy was very erratic. He would make plans to go to a particular place, then he would change his mind and go somewhere else. Well, on October 19, 2021, a congressional delegation consisting of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and other high-ranking politicians took a trip to Jordan. And we're Hal Turner, live from New York City, 9.15 p.m. here on the East Coast of the United States, October 30th, 2019. So uh, a congressional delegation traveled from the United States to Jordan on or about October 19th, and they were overseas, you know, the 19th, 20th, 21st, etc. And uh, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and other members of the United States House of Representatives went on this trip. Why would the Speaker of the House take a trip to Jordan? Well, you know, we were told uh, they were talking to people about this and that. But Jordan borders Syria. And during the last couple of years, uh, well, more than a couple, during the last you know decade, when a lot of these troubles in Syria began, Syria became a hub for illicit narcotics production and distribution. When President Trump ordered... U.S. military troops to leave Syria. A lot of people realized that they would no longer be able to be making illicit profits from the illicit drug trade taking place in Syria. And there has been speculation, only speculation, that Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi might be a person getting her beak wet with uh, some of that illicit drug money. Now, nobody's ever provo- provided any proof, but there's been speculation. And one wonders why Speaker Pelosi chose to travel to the country right next door to Syria about a week after President Trump ordered U.S. troops to withdraw. After, after Jordan, the congressional delegation, well, either before or after Jordan, the congressional delegation also traveled to Afghanistan. And that fits with this whole drug theme because Afghanistan is the world's largest exporter of poppies. 
from which opium is derived. And from opium is where we, the world gets its illegal heroin. So it was interesting that Speaker Pelosi, of all the places on earth she chose to go, she chose to go to Jordan, right next to Syria, and she chose to go to Afghanistan, both countries, hubs for international narcotics trafficking. According to some of my former colleagues from my years with the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force, either Abu Baker al-Baghdadi himself or an emissary of his allegedly met with Pelosi's delegation while they were overseas. Now, President Trump, when describing the raid that killed al-Baghdadi, said that they had uh, information as to his actual location. Well, the intelligence colleagues that I worked with for years tell me, they haven't provided proof, but they tell me that Pelosi and the congressional delegation were under surveillance by the intelligence community while they were overseas. And during this surveillance, either Baghdadi or his emissary was seen meeting with members of the congressional delegation. That person was followed back to Baghdadi's compound. And that was how it was confirmed as to this man's location. Now, ladies and gentlemen, why would the Speaker of the House of Representatives meet with al-Baghdadi or al-Baghdadi's emissary? What the hell is going on here with the people in our U.S. government? And these are some of the same people, mind you, that are trying to illegitimately impeach our president, Donald Trump. It came out last week from the Russian government, which released satellite photos showing that U.S. troops and U.S. private military contractors have been stealing millions of of dollars worth of oil from the oil fields in northeast Syria. According to the Russians and the um, satellite photographs they released, hundreds upon hundreds of oil tanker trucks are regularly seen traveling into the area of Syria that was controlled by U.S. troops loading up oil that was being stolen from Syrian oil wells, then those trucks would convoy into nearby countries where the oil was processed and sold on the black market at $38 a barrel. According to the Russian intelligence, U.S. troops and paramilitary contractors were stealing $30 million a month in oil. Russia went on to say that payments for this stolen oil, which was smuggled to nearby countries, that payments for that, that oil were sent by wire transfer to Swiss bank accounts held by the CIA, other intelligence agencies from other countries, and they claimed people in the Pentagon. And reading between the lines, it was not hard to realize that they meant generals 
or high-ranking Pentagon officials making money off the theft and smuggling of $30 million a month in oil from Syria. Now, after President Trump announced he had ordered the withdrawal of American troops from Syria, he kind of changed uh, gears a little bit. A day or so later, he started saying, well, you know, we're going to keep the oil. We're going to send some troops back into Syria to protect the oil. Because they said they didn't want ISIS to grab the oil again and start getting their hands on lots of money so that they could reform their terrorist group. But Russia said, given the fact that $30 million a month is being stolen there by the Americans, it doesn't surprise anyone that, Russia, that uh, U.S. officials would do whatever they can to keep control of the oil areas in Syria. Because if they're making 30 million a month stealing it, why would they give it up? And as recently as today, both the President of the United States and the Defense Secretary confirm U.S. troops heading back into Syria to keep control over the oil. And yesterday, Defense Secretary Esper made it clear if anyone tried to challenge U.S. control of the oil, the U.S. would respond with overwhelming military force. Well, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I don't mean to be crude, and I'm sorry if this sounds hurtful. But to me, if these thefts are actually taking place, as Russian intelligence seemed to prove, that would make us, what, bandits? Pirates? What? Thieves? Smugglers? It's not what I pay my military to do. It's not what I pay my elected officials to do. And so that's what I covered on my radio show last night. I dare say you have not heard this information from nearly any other media source anywhere in the world. Now, there's more, and it relates to those diplomatic cables. Speculation yesterday was that the diplomatic cables between al-Baghdadi's compound and the State Department in Washington were not the only diplomatic cables that were seized by U.S. Special Operations Forces. There were questions as to whether or not there were cables between al-Baghdadi and Israeli government entities. Lo and behold, yesterday, while all this stuff was starting to break, Israel announced that they were closing all of their embassies worldwide effective today. They went further. They said that no one will be allowed onto any embassy or consulate property and no services will be provided to anyone from any Israeli embassy or consulate. Well, why? Now, a couple of months ago, there was some uh, work rule changes in the Israeli Ministry of Finance, and this resulted in kind of a work stoppage in certain elements of the Israeli government. And these new rules are what's being blamed publicly by Israel for the closing of the embassy. But ladies and gentlemen, this doesn't this doesn't wash. The only reason countries close embassies is they're going to war with somebody, right? And they close the embassies and consulates in that country. Or there's an imminent security threat 
to a particular embassy. They might close it. But never, and I mean never, does a country close its embassies worldwide over a budget issue. Because we've got budget issues here in the United States all the time. At the end of September, the United States federal budget ends. October 1st is the new fiscal year. Well, if the Congress of the United States hasn't increased the debt limit or hasn't voted to approve a budget, then technically nobody could get paid. But we don't close our embassies. Our diplomatic people don't go home. They just keep working because everybody knows that once the paperwork gets done, they'll get paid anyway. So why is it that on the very day information started coming out that diplomatic cables were seized from Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's compound in Syria that the Israeli government closed all their embassies worldwide. Are they worried that if more information comes out, countries might want to try to arrest Israeli diplomats? Here in the United States, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Chairman of the uh, House Intelligence Committee, Congressman Adam Schiff, among others, are endeavoring to impeach President Donald Trump because he made a phone call to the president of Ukraine, and during that phone call, he asked for Ukraine's help in getting a hold of a server, computer server, used by a group called CrowdStrike. And uh, this may have criminal evidence or evidence of criminality on it uh, involving former U.S. Vice President Joseph Biden. Well, when people in the government heard that President Trump was asking about the CrowdStrike server, red alerts went off because that CrowdStrike server is the machine through which a lot of criminal things went on. Emails about illegal money transfers, emails about weapons transfers. And the people in government who blew the whistle on this know to an absolute certainty that if the Trump administration is successful in getting its hands on that CrowdStrike server, which incidentally is in the hands of a Ukrainian oligarch, then a lot of people here in the United States are going to go to prison because that server's got the evidence. And the guy in Ukraine who has the server will not destroy it because he wants to hold that information over people's heads for his own benefit. So the server exists. It has not been destroyed. And it is being sought by U.S. law enforcement. The United States of America has a mutual legal assistance treaty with Ukraine. It is perfectly lawful and proper for a U.S. president to ask the president of Ukraine for law enforcement cooperation under that treaty. President Trump didn't do anything wrong. But right away, folks in the government who hate Trump or love Joe Biden politicized it and said, well, Trump's trying to get information on his political opponent for 2020. The election in 2020. Well, sorry, there isn't an election in 2020. There's no ballots uh, been printed. No petitions have been filed. No candidate has been selected. The president's just doing his job. They don't want him to do his job because if he does his job, a lot of people in the body politic here in America are going to go to prison. So they're trying to say, oh, this was a quid pro quo. Trump withheld U.S. aid to Ukraine to blackmail them into giving dirt on Biden. Well, that's not what happened at all. 
But it's very interesting that the Democrats be the ones to talk about threatening to withhold U.S. money unless a foreign country does something. Because, ladies and gentlemen, nine days ago, Democrat presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren publicly said she could withhold U.S. aid to Israel unless Israel stops putting settlements in the occupied West Bank. Well, that sounds like a quid pro quo. Why aren't the Democrats screaming about Elizabeth Warren? And this was even covered by Newsweek. Yeah, Newsweek article, I'll read briefly. Elizabeth Warren could pull U.S. military aid from Israel if it does not stop building settlements in the West Bank. The Democratic 2020 primary candidate, who has taken a lead in recent polls, told The Hill, quote, everything is on the table should she become president and Israel continues building settlements in the West Bank. Well, there you have it. A quid pro quo. Do what Elizabeth Warren wants or she will withhold U.S. aid if she's elected president. Why is it okay for Elizabeth Warren to do that, but it is not okay for President Trump to do it? Well, it is okay. What the hell do they think we provide foreign aid for? To have power over the recipient. You want a simpler analogy? Mouse traps. Yeah. Mouse traps work because the mice don't understand why the food is free. <laughs> Snap! That's why America provides money to foreign countries so we can hold it over their head to get them to do what we want. Duh! And for this reason, ladies and gentlemen, the entire, and I mean the entire, impeachment effort being undertaken by Democrats in the House of Representatives is illegitimate. This is an attempt to usurp the votes of 62 million Americans just like me who voted for Donald Trump. This is an attempt at usurpation. And it is being done contrary to the requirements of the U.S. Constitution. U.S. Constitution says the president can be impeached, quote, for high crimes and misdemeanors, unquote. What crime do the Democrats allege took place? Well, the short answer, they don't. They're not alleging a crime took place. Well, it's real simple. If there's no crime, there's no impeachment. That's the way it is. It's been that way for 240 some odd years, and that's the way it's going to stay. And ladies and gentlemen, if the Democrats go ahead with this impeachment without any high crime or misdemeanor, they are trying to invalidate your vote. That, ladies and gentlemen, is tyranny. And the founding fathers of these United States gave American citizens the Second Amendment so that they could maintain a free state, a state of freedom, to be free from tyranny. So if Congress becomes tyrannical and tries to nullify our freely cast ballots and throw out our president without legitimate cause, then that in and of itself 
is tyranny worthy of being confronted? And I dare say there are a lot of Americans who have expressed to me their feeling or their feelings that are in agreement with my analysis. Now, I don't want to see a civil war here in these United States. Definitely do not. Um, Civil war would be horrible. Uh, I, I think it probably will not be necessary. I don't think it would be proper. I don't think we should do it. I don't think any of you should do it. And let me say emphatically, I, me personally, have absolutely no plans or intentions at all to initiate any kind of criminal action or civil war or insurrection. I will not initiate it. Uh, But uh, that said, there are people who do not share my view. And so I guess... We'll see how things play out, but I have a sense that we are living real history right now. Real history. I like to take uh, things from various sources, so just listen to this as well as uh, confirmation of what you've just heard. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Sure. Okay. okay. Awesome. All right. So let's yeah. get to the real meat and potatoes here. The title of this scope is uh, Benghazi question mark, Baghdadi question mark. Holy fook. So this morning yeah. I got a phone call from Director Mike and Director Mike says, are you sitting down? Because I can't believe what I'm about to think. So uh, I'm going to let Director Mike tell you guys the same thing that he told me. So why don't you pick it up right there, Director Mike? Well, first thing I said was you needed to get some black rifle beyond black coffee. That's true. Uh, That's true. I don't don't know that they can. Yeah, you can get it. Anyways, the Special Forces is currently going through documents that they seized in that raid the other night. And uh, they have found State Department cables to these people from our State Department. Um, I don't know exactly whose names are on the cable, but they were cables from our State Department to these ISIS bastards. And I'm being told that Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, James Clapper, John Brennan, and James Comey are in deeper shit than we thought. So they said that there is incriminating evidence that their military intelligence is going through it and they're going to get it over to the DOJ when they're done going over it and all that stuff. That's just typical protocol. And uh, But it's not looking good for that bunch. Their blatant corruption and criminal activity, you know, they sit there with these attitudes, oh, well, you know, it's our administration. They're not going to do anything. Yes. Yeah, so... I, I'm, oh, from a DOJ official, a friend of mine for many years, he says that uh, we're probably looking at treason here. And this, and if they collaborated with the enemy, that is the full definition of, of treason right there. So that's what yeah. I got. Yeah. So as you can well imagine that uh, I've been trying to wrap my head around the implications of this all morning, and, I, and I'm still not fully up to speed mentally on where all of this is going to connect but uh, it's it's interesting that the president says in his speech he says when he's when he's updating the the world essentially on what happened he says we found evidence as to the origins of isis and then we get told Basically, late last night, Mike got the call, but uh, I was busy and I didn't get his phone call till this morning. So essentially, late last night, after that, we're told by his DOJ contact that uh, essentially they found evidence of cables directly from our State Department. I just, I, I mean, think about that. That is massive, massive news that 
quite honestly, we're, we're, it's going to be difficult and when we're be, ever going to hear that. With all that goes through my mind, it's kind of sickening. Yeah. It, it is. It, it leaves a sickening feeling in my stomach. Yeah. It, that blatant disregard, totally. And it, all, and it goes back to Benghazi. Uh, we've said since like three we two three weeks afterwards that 700 shoulder fired missiles come up missing after our four men were killed at Benghazi and then we have Hillary Clinton and Susan Rice claiming that it was due to a YouTube video I mean these people aren't that was debunked hey these people aren't even good liars no I mean, it's, it's just say you know hey this is what we did we hung four people out to dry four American heroes were killed and uh, by the way, 700 shoulder-fired missiles left, and uh, they were found in the hands of, hands of uh, ISIS in Syria. Two mm. weeks later. Yeah. This whole thing stinks. It, it stinks. Stinks to the high heaven, that's for sure. That is it, absolutely for sure. It's disgusting. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it really is. It, it, this is a difficult one here because, yes, we are... I want to be clear because, uh, uh, and again, I know that's my idiom, but the people in the chat are asking. So, yes, we are specifically directly saying that what we are being told is when our military men took over that compound, they, not, they found cash, they found weapons, they found cables directly from our State Department. And currently, as boxes of documents, boxes of documents that they got, they carry their entire their entire system they carried it with them. Not to mention the laptops they still they got out of there. Mm. And those gotta be gone over forensically yet. So there's a way there's a long road here, but at the same time I I'm, I'm just disgusted by it. Yeah, so we're we're directly saying our military intelligence is currently processing all of the evidence gathered from the compound. That's yes. where it's currently at. We currently have DOJ people that have already are on the ground looking at this stuff as well, but they can't take possession yet because there's protocol. So right now the military's in charge that will or may change relatively quickly. Uh, but that's government terms relatively quickly. It's right. not going to happen right. fast because not the speed that we're used to. We're, we are the internet generation. We expect it to happen next week. It's not going to happen next week. Yeah. But it's, it will happen because they've already put DOJ officials on the ground to make sure that they are in touch with what's going on due to John Durham's investigation. Anything that may influence or affect anything he's working on, he needs to know about. So that's why they're putting early eyes on this stuff to try to make sure that everybody understands what, what's there. What, what did they just find? So uh, it's not going to slow up what's going on. I'm being, I'm being as clear as I can be about this. John Durham's working his ass off. They, they just have eyeballs on it right now in yeah. order to know if there's anything over there that needs to be fast-tracked to John Durham. That's right. what I'm saying. So and they that's may, why. They may have sent FBI agents over there already. To work with them, that that yeah. happened, but I don't I don't know that for certain. But I would expect that that happened. Yeah. Now we're. But go ahead. I was just going to say. Well, also in addition to this, we're also being told again. I know everybody's tired of fucking hearing it, including us. Pfizer yeah. should drop this week. That's that's what we're being told. Whether that's true or not is is up in the air. But uh, that's what we're being told. And then in the news, we're hearing that Nancy Pelosi has actually said they plan on scheduling a vote for Thursday. So yeah. it's more important now than ever that you guys are working the phones to Congress, both the Senate and the House, and telling them they better drop this bullshit. If you vote for that and you're a Republican, you're getting primaried. If you're a Democrat, we're coming for you. That's just the way it is. So. Yeah. If you don't fucking pick up the phones now, it's all in the play. Everything is up in the air today. So now is the time to light those phones on fire. So it is. That's where we're at. That's what's happening over the weekend since <laughs> yesterday. 
<laughs> I literally was just on the air yesterday, and the whole world changed in the last eight hours. So uh, anything else we need to tell them, Mike? <coughs> That's all I know for now. If there's any updates, of course, I'll tell you. But I got this info from one of the same people that I've been getting everything else from. So, And they've always been reliable so far. They sure have, because we've been on this, and, and it's not just yeah. us. That you can, we try to be very clear with what we get given versus what we think. And so right now, this yeah. is where we're at. So, yep, I get out know, there. I know Durham is going on the angle of Obama administration. Obama and his officials, were all, they were shaking down governments around the world. Yeah. Yes, Romania, Ukraine, you name it. They were, they're, and they're looking into all of that. They were shaking them down. Yeah. So, so we got to find out where that went you know, and who got the favors for what in return. I suspect a lot of our tax dollars went for uh, personal and political gain of Democrats. I don't doubt it for a second. They've done a lot of other things with our money. Why not some more? You know? So that's it. That's all I have. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for my daily scopes. We try to keep them quick, short, and to the point. And that's about as quick, short, and to the point as we can get. Don't forget following this uh, by, what is it, top of the hour is going to be Boogie Bumper. Uh, then you got, uh, you got uh, uh, oh, my God, I can't even talk anymore. Uh, Chris Mack, 44, at the Mac Files, 44, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, bringing the heat. Uh, his, he, he's going to be out there as well. And then of course, uh, watch Enabler Abe, UK Neil, all our normal friends and family around here. So I will see you later. I will see you tomorrow. Aloha. Everybody have a great day. Later.